I have a tendency to pluralize my flaws. So much so, in fact, that I originally wrote that as people have a tendency to pluralize their flaws, but I, I'm not here to offer a tua culpa, so I, I'll leave it to you to decide whether you want to lump yourself in with me at the end of this whole thing. See, it occurred to me that I've been making a pretty egregious error in my evaluation of religiosity for the past several years. We, we talk a lot on this show about why people are religious, and we offer up plenty of explanations, but I tend to focus on fear of death more than any of the others. You know, now that's certainly not an answer anybody would give on a survey, of course. When you ask a person why they're religious, they're never going to say, because I'm afraid to die. But that doesn't mean it's not a major motivating factor. Of course, being that it's not something you can glean from self-reporting or even direct observation for that matter, it's pretty much impossible to nail down the extent to which it drives people's religiosity. And yet, despite that limitation, if you asked me to tell you why people are religious, that's the first place I'd have gone. You know, why do people believe in God? They're afraid to die. Now, obviously, that's a crazy oversimplification of my own position, of course. I've always recognized that there's more nuance to it than that, and the specific blend of reasons is going to vary from person to person. That's not what I'm mea culping about. It's not an error in judgment to present a plausible explanation, even if it can't be directly measured. But the error that I did make was acting like there was nowhere to go for evidence. I, I mean, sure, we can't collect scientific data, but we can check anecdotal evidence. At least most of us can. Because while most religious people won't be able to give you an honest answer on this one, most of us have at least one trustworthy source because most of us used to be religious, right? And to some extent, at least, we can trust our own answers. So, quick bit of biographical info that I've covered on the show before. I was raised nominally Christian, never really went to church. In my early teens, somebody turned me onto Wicca, and I got into that for an embarrassingly long time, like 10 years or whatever. And then I eventually kicked myself in the head hard enough to knock all that bullshit out. Now, as you'll know if you were ever into neo-pagan bullshit, there's no strict dogma in these religions. There's a couple of principles that more or less everybody agrees on. But after that, everybody kind of comes to the table with their own nonsense, and then everybody else just nods along even when the various bullshits become mutually exclusive. So, I had this loosely amalgamated set of beliefs that were too flimsy to formulate into one solid theology. I'd made a few stabs at a grand unified theory, but it turns out bullshit makes a terrible building block. Who would have thunk? In fact, it was these ongoing efforts that eventually led me to give up on the whole worldview. I mean, that and the fact that most of the smart people agreed that I was wrong and the fact that most of the stupid people agreed that I was right. All of those things in combination led me to atheism. And like most people losing their faith, I resisted at first, right? I, this was a long, drawn-out process for me, so I had plenty of time to come to grips with it. And I, I, even though I never had that, like, you know, that holy shit, there's no God moment that so many listeners have described to me, there was a binary moment where I realized that I couldn't keep half ass believing in this stuff anymore, right? And even though I'd long since convinced myself from an intellectual perspective, I still held on to it for emotional reasons. But what were my emotional reasons, right? What was the connection? As it happens, it wasn't mortality. You know, up until then, I more or less believed in reincarnation, but I thought about it long enough to realize that reincarnation sans memories is the same as just dying, right? So I'd already come to grips with the idea that Noah would eventually cease to exist. No, to the extent that I can trust reflections on 16-year-old memories anyway, what anchored me to my religion wasn't mortality, it was the narrative. You know, consider what this bullshit offered to me. By day, I was assistant managing a Papa John's and falling behind on car payments, but by night... I was unlocking the mysteries of the ancient magi. I was communing with eternal spiritual forces through playing cards. I was, I was tapping into forces at the very edge of human knowledge and beyond. I, I've said it on the show a dozen times, right, at least. I, I stuck with my religion because I really wanted superpowers. But for some reason, when it came time to ask why other people cling to their religion, I was awfully quick to overlook that aspect and write it all off as cowardice. I mean, think about it. You're an average person, or at least odds are that you're an average person anyway. You're confronted with two worldviews. In one, you're a chemical anomaly that occupies an insignificant portion of a cosmic pebble for an insignificant fraction of time. Right? You're going to spend that time engaged in activities that have no cosmic significance. You're almost certainly not playing a critical role in the advancement of human knowledge. You're almost certainly not playing a critical role in the unfolding of international affairs. You're almost certainly worried about mundane shit that won't even matter to you next year, let alone the people who occupy the same space in a century. And then along comes this competing narrative. In this one, sure, you still have to do mundane shit to comport with your secret identity, but even when it seems to the casual observer like you're just looking for a parking space, you're really communing with the divine, right? You spend your days playing a critical role in the eternal cosmic battle between good and evil. Hell, your very being is comprised entirely of the most valuable substance in the universe, a soul. It's so prized that even the omnipotent being that created it fights over it for some reason. And not only do you have one of your own, but you can save others. 
You, you can do something so unique and wonderful that not even the creator of the universe could do it without you. When God hangs out with the angels, he brags about you. He has a plan for you. He loves you enough to die for you. But more important than any of that, he needs you. You know, without you here to defend him in the mortal realm, the cosmic balance might slip past the critical mass of evil. It may look like you're singing a hymn, but when you strip away the mortal facade, you're battling demons. You're locked in combat with the devil himself, warring alongside God in the only battle that's ever mattered. Now, even an atheist has to admit that's more appealing than pond scum that learned to wipe, isn't it? And despite our obvious deficits in the narrative department, I've been guilty of largely overlooking it. You know, of course, like fear of death, it's not something you can measure through self-reporting. It's another motivation that only works if you're not consciously aware of it. So who's to say what percent of religiosity comes from that versus what percent comes from fear of death versus what percent comes from never bothering to question what mom said, right? But if any of it comes from this narrative issue, and clearly some of it does, it's something we need to keep in mind. It's something we need to recognize, confront, and counteract. And maybe the reason I've been so reluctant to do so is that it's a really hard question to answer. You know, what, what do we do with this information? We can't just make up a bullshit narrative for atheism and nothing that reality offers up is ever going to compete with unfettered gibberish. So until now, all I've got is the humanist answer, right? Our goal has to be raising the average person's quality of life to the point where reality has a good enough narrative all by itself. Look, I mean, humans don't need supernatural control over parking spaces, but they do need control. You know, they don't need hope of heaven, but they do need hope. And we have to raise that hope for them and then just hope ourselves that most people will still take an imperfect cure over a perfect lie. As near as I can tell, that's the only answer I have at the moment. And, and you know what? With enough effort on our part, maybe it's the only one we need.